Sudan has been caught in a bloody war between the country's army and a militia, the Rapid Support Forces, for 16 months, with tens of millions of Sudanese civilians caught in between. This week, the United States mediated peace talks in Geneva. The RSF militia sent a delegation, but at the last minute appeared to not officially participate in the talks. The Sudanese armed forces refused to attend altogether. In the first of her reports from a rare trip inside the country with the support of the Pulitzer Center, special correspondent Leila Molana Allen sat down with Sudan's vice president in Port Sudan on the Red Sea. <laughs> Five years ago, elated Sudanese, young and old, danced in the streets after countrywide protests brought down Sudan's 30-year dictator and indicted war criminal Omar al-Bashir. Democracy had arrived. But just two years later, the Sudanese army and a rehabilitated militia, the Rapid Support Forces, united under Army Chief Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and took power in what Sudanese civil society calls a coup against the people. Malik Agar is Sudan's vice president and deputy head of the military junta that's ruled the country since 2021. A former insurgent leader, he's been a leading political and military figure for decades. Before the explosion of the conflict last April, RSF leader General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, widely known as Hemedti, was vice president. Agar succeeded him after the RSF broke away from Sudan's army and began to fight against it. The war erupted seemingly without warning, taking most Sudanese by surprise in its speed and ferocity. The news hour sat down with Vice President Agar to discuss the latest on the fighting and the prospects for peace. The attacking force was a collateral force, very huge, and they, they put the Sudan government army into a position of defense. And uh, after one year, the Sudanese army managed to change the mood of the war, and now the Sudanese army is on offense. So to fight them, to follow them from area to area is rather difficult for a conventional army. This is why it's, it's, it's taking long. Agar has been an outspoken critic of international attempts to mediate the conflict and encourage negotiations with the RSF, saying the only solution is the complete military destruction of the militia. Any leader in Sudan who can go into negotiations with the RSF is committing a political society. RSF is, is, a, is an instrument, is a tool for the UAE and others. Hemeti has no control of the forces here. How do you kill people? How do you rape girls and women and everybody and destroy the infrastructure and you want to rule? Then, then you have no control of these forces. Multiple foreign governments, including the United Arab Emirates, Russia, Saudi Arabia and Iran, have taken an interest in the conflict resulting in a steady flow of foreign weapons and mercenaries on both sides. In June, Agar travelled to Russia to meet with President Vladimir Putin. We asked what he hoped to achieve. Because I'm fighting a war, and when I'm fighting a war, I don't need tanks, I need weapons, and who manufactures weapons. And if I have the ability of getting those weapons, if I have the means of getting this one, I will get it. Attention to the conflict has been muted in the West. But news that Sudan's government had repaired diplomatic relations with Iran and signed a new weapons deal this spring raised alarm. Agar says if the United States is worried about where they get their weapons, it should sell to Sudan itself. We are not saying here, I'm not confessing here we are buying weapons from Iran, but we are ready to buy weapons from any, 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 any country. Human rights groups have documented evidence of weapons being supplied to the RSF by the UAE, Russia and Turkey, among others, smuggled into RSF territory via neighboring Chad. The United States is a leading arms seller to the UAE. What impact are those foreign weapons having on your ability to fight this war? Definitely they have, they have, a, they have an effect, a great effect, because uh, these are new weapons, they are not used. Sudanese army, they, did, they never had uh, such uh, uh, weapons. These, these, these militia are being supported by the uh, UAE, yeah, I mean, let me put it bluntly, by the UAE and others. Uh, the UAE has, uh, has a lot of economical interests in, uh, in Sudan. One of them, number one of them is uh, gold mining in Sudan. They wanted some sort of agricultural lands in Sudan. They had also an interest of having an, uh, an area on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Red Sea. For, for their own interests. We believe there is other interests from other countries also. So it is a complex situation. 
What do you want the United States to do in terms of taking responsibility for the use of those US manufactured weapons being used to slaughter innocent civilians here in Sudan? One thing that the US government can do is, one, to stop supplying the EU aid. They know, the Americans, they know that weapons have been used in Sudan. There is no doubt about that because the evidence are there. So then for them also, they have to decide what do, do they want a war in Sudan to continue or do they want, as they talk about democracy and human rights, do they want to preserve the human rights of the Sudanese? And you cannot bring democracy on the middle of the guns. And you cannot bring democracy when you are using militias. So you believe that these efforts on behalf of the United States to try and become involved in peace talks for Sudan are simply political posturing ahead of the election? Yes, right. yeah, yes, 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 definitely yes. They are, they are just political alibi and they, they are not serious about it. When these elections are over, they will change their mind. The US is mediating talks this week in Geneva, aimed at improving the humanitarian situation. But both of the chief parties to the conflict are absent. Leaders say they have little faith in the process. What is it that makes you feel that this US administration isn't a serious partner for peace in Sudan? Their behavior tells me that. The US, the US administration, they have never came here. They, we have an envoy who has never is, uh, I mean, put a leg in, uh, in, in Sudan. And he's an special envoy for Sudan. And he's just talking with others that from Egypt and uh, Uganda, Kenya, and all these things. And, and you just bypass Sudan in the middle here. US engagement has been patchy. Special envoy to Sudan, Tom Periello, has never visited the country in his role. A planned visit alongside US aid director Samantha Power was aborted after the US team refused to travel any further inside Sudan than the airport citing security concerns. What does that say to you about their seriousness of being involved in peace talks with Sudan? If you are serious to solve a problem somewhere, why you don't go and meet the president in this country? Why you don't meet us in our country? But this is not, a, it's not happening. Meanwhile, civil political leaders say they've been cut out of the peace talks and plans for Sudan's future. Is it the intention of the Sudanese armed forces to immediately give back power to a democratically elected leader when the war is over? Yet they are ready to take the country to elections and hand over power. And that is what will happen? That is what's supposed to happen. You win the war first and then you go for, for, you go for uh, establishment of democracy. For now, as the war rages on, democracy has been put on the back burner. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Leila Malana Allen in Port Sudan.